My name is Cindy Crum and I'm the CEO of Mobile Moxie. We do mobile SEO and ASO consulting, uh, helping companies rank well in mobile and desktop search. And we also have a mobile marketing tool set available online. Uh, this is a webinar of a presentation that was originally given at a NATO conference about digital strategy and digital communication strategy. Uh, so this is called Algorithms and How They Rank and Spread Information. And I want to start by looking backwards to see how historically has information and news been spread. And if we think about it, um, you know, originally it was word of mouth and then we got the radio and we maybe listened to the radio together and then TV and there were only a few channels and we often watched together in the living room. And now uh, we have more cable and digital TV, uh, lots of different options and integrations with information coming uh, both potentially through a cable, but also over the internet and on demand uh, and through apps that you can add. Uh, but the watching may sometimes look like this, but more often I think it's likely that it looks like this. People are consuming more and more video, not only on their phone, but independently on their phone, because it's hard to watch a video on a phone together. And so the way information is spread is being more and more impacted by algorithms, and that's especially true of uh, video content. So we know that worldwide, uh, people's subscription to OTT or cable company kinds of TV uh, are going down. Uh, so that, that changes the way we think about information and TV because when you publish news and information on a cable uh, provider, it often has to go through some kinds of regulations. Uh, but when information is accessed over the internet through less official channels, uh, through streaming and apps and things like that, there's less regulation happening. And streaming is what's replacing the OTT cable connections. Cable cutters are going directly to their internet connections for their TV. And the largest group uh, that's growing in online streaming, streaming service subscriptions is the 18 to 29 year olds. So this seems like it's the, the new replacement that people who have cable TV subscriptions are going to slowly be outpaced by people who uh, switch to just online streaming. And what's interesting about that is that when they're streaming, they're also often sharing uh, or discovering the information using uh, either social media or search. And these things are uh, driven by algorithms. So if you look at Google, video content, content is 50 times more likely to drive an organic uh, search result than a plain text, uh, an organic search traffic than plain text. On Facebook, uh, 8 billion or more video views are um, done per day. And now they're adding playlists where it seems like they wanna compete directly with YouTube. And then of course there's YouTube, uh, the original video platform now al allows people to subscribe or rent or buy movies and TV, as well as live streaming news, music uh, and sports. Uh, so they're really building out uh, a full replacement. And then there's things like Twitter, where uh, a video tweet is six times more likely to be retweeted than just a photo tweet, uh, and potentially extremely more likely to be shared or retweeted uh, than just a text tweet. So people really love video, and they love to share video, they love to click on video on their phones. And social media is where this is happening. Uh, we know that social media is a huge force around the world. 47% of people in the world are on some kind of social media. And 80% uh, of those people are accessing it primarily on their mobile phones. So this is where things are happening, social media uh, on mobile. And of course, mobile is growing dramatically. We know that more people have access to mobile phones than have access to things like bank accounts, electricity, uh, and running water. So the mobile uh, device is an important means of conveying any kind of information. And with mobile devices, we have more, uh, more to kind of cope with or more to understand because there are so many uh, different apps and websites that have uh, media accessible and shareable 
on them. And as I mentioned, they're, they're less regulated uh, and often more niche. So it's not just that you have to settle for what everyone else is watching, but you can dig deep uh, and find content that really speaks to you, whatever that is. And um, you may be one of a, a much smaller group of people consuming it, but there are people consuming it and there are people creating it uh, just to suit what you're looking for. And so that's both uh, an opportunity and a risk. But the thing about all of these videos is they have to be surfaced, they have to be discovered, they have to be found. And the way people are finding the videos is through search. Uh, whether that search starts on YouTube uh, or Google or potentially Facebook or Twitter, people are searching for, for the videos to find them, to consume them. And so the algorithms that are used in these platforms are either helping or hurting the ability for one video's uh, contents to be surfaced and shared. Now, the one I focus on day to day is Google. I love working with the Google algorithm. That's, that's what we specialize at, in as a company is surfacing things in Google's mobile search algorithm, as well as desktop. Mobile is a little bit trickier, uh, but usually what works on mobile works really well on desktop too. Uh, but algorithms do in fact change the world. And I don't think anyone would really disagree. Uh, but they might not understand specifically why or be able to articulate it. So let's start there and understand what are algorithms and why are they so important. So when you think about an algorithm, it's basically just a long math equation uh, with different weightings for different things. So this aspect of the algorithm could be heavily weighted and this aspect of the algorithm could be more lightly weighted, but still count. Um, and the algorithm will have pluses and minuses. If you have a lot of this, that's a plus. If you have a lot of that, that could be a minus. Um, and so it's a way to score and uh, aggregate all the scores of many different signals uh, for complex things. But in doing that, when they surface and rank order uh, different pieces of content, that means they're necessarily almost always not surfacing or uh, not emphasizing certain pieces of content. They're ranking those pieces of content lower, making them less likely to be seen. So the algorithm is usually doing things like that intentionally. It might think that some content is lower quality or has lower demand, lower need, uh, things like that. So it might be uh, ranking it lower uh, assuming that people will find what they want higher up. But that means that that piece of information has a harder time coming to light, uh, being found, being shared. And so with that filtering, uh, what's happening is people are being exposed to certain pieces of information that rank well, much more than they're being exposed to other information that doesn't rank well. And that has the tendency to create an amplifi amplification effect where because people are exposed to it, they're more likely to share it. And so whatever is ranking well is then also more likely to be shared and amplified and shared again. Uh, and so we get into kind of an echo chamber just based on the algorithm. And that echo chamber can serve to, in some ways, distort the perception of reality. Now this is uh, happening at different levels in different platforms. Um, and it's not necessarily uh, malicious. It's not done intentionally by the platforms. It's just the, the reality fallout from how algorithms and internet sharing, internet search work together. But the problem with that kind of filtering and unequal amplification um, and um, unequal uh, attention, different kinds of information, is that people tend to believe what they see on a screen, and especially they tend to believe what is ranked well in a search. Uh, and there's this phenomenon uh, that's been written about for digital security called In Screen We Trust, and it's something that hackers take advantage of, in fact. A and that is that we tend to believe whatever we see on a screen, even though it's just a digital representation of some reality. Uh, and, and we also tend to believe uh, in search results. Uh, computers are made by smart people. And so if a computer says something, it's probably right. And Google is made by smart people. So if Google surfaces something, it might be right. And people don't approach their devices and their search engines or their social media with enough skepticism uh, 
and, and they don't even approach it with the same skepticism that they might with something that they see in the real world on the street or something that a friend perhaps tells them. Uh, they just tend to trust the digital world. And that's difficult because uh, as professionals in SEO or in digital communication, we know that facts uh, can spread uh, just as easily as fiction. And we hope that the facts are spread more, but fiction can also be spread in, in an unfortunately effective way. Um, and so that's concerning. And since the, the algorithms um, aren't regulated in the same way that a cable news TV uh, station might be regulated, uh, they, they believe that they have no um, uh, onus to do a good job of filtering out fact and fiction. Now, most of the social networks and search engines are starting to try uh, to do a better job of filtering out um, what is real and what is fake or questionable. Uh, they don't believe it's their responsibility. Uh, and so that's potentially a concern. So algorithms can be really hard to understand. Um, and I know this um, because it's kind of my job to often explain algorithms. Uh, but they're hard to understand, and it's for a number of reasons. Uh, number one, Google uses over 200 ranking factors uh, to rank one result. Now, this uh, graph is from a company called SparkToro that writes a lot about ranking factors um, and how information gets shared. Uh, but what's interesting here is these are the average assessment of what people think a ranking factor might be. This isn't as reported by Google. This is as reported by people who work in the, the SEO and digital space. It's what they would estimate. As, and these are all potentially uh, positive ranking factors, or they have some kind of bi-directional positive and negative uh, exposure or a net positive and negative um, instance in the web. Um, and so when, when they're listed here, uh, they're usually listed in the positive. If you're mobile friendly, that's a positive ranking factor. If you have relevant overall page content, that's a positive ranking factor. If you don't have relevant uh, overall page content, that could be a negative factor. Um, but the positive and negatives aren't always necessarily equal. Uh, and the query can change which algorithm is used. So the query can change how much different elements in that uh, weighting uh, part of the algorithm can be impacted. So in one algorithm or one query, mobile friendliness might be more important. And in another query, uh, page content uh, might be more important. And so this is another report from SEOs, people whose job it is to help rake the right content of um, how SEOs believe Google's algorithm rates the different ranking inputs. Now, the biggest percent here is the 66.3%, which represents the weight of algorithm factors, uh, which represents the, the belief that the weight of ranking algorithm facti factors varies widely, depending on the query. Now, there are also uh, local uh, specific algorithms, uh, and that's because some queries show local intent. People are looking for something near them. And so Google has different algorithms that look out for those kinds of queries and rank those things differently. And in that case, you're impacted by the local algorithm as well as local availability of whatever it is that you're searching for. So if you're searching, for instance, uh, for a nail salon in Denver, then you're only going to get the nail salons in Denver. Uh, and it's going to be more likely to show things things like a map pack uh, and local websites that clearly have a business owner or a business location in Denver. So you might get the inclusion of the map pack and then you might get more blue links uh, that seem to be from businesses that are based in Denver. And so people doing searching uh, test searches who forget about all of these changes might oversimplify in their mind uh, to believe that what they see ranking on their phone is what everyone else sees, but it may actually be very specific uh, to their location and the exact wording of their query uh, and things like that. So Google, most 
Most SEOs believe that there are a couple top ranking factors that factor into most or if not all searches, and that's relevance, uh, domain authority, page authority, and links. These are the things that, uh, regardless of what kind of query or where the query is, that, that most SEOs believe factor into every single query. But again, they could be weighted differently uh, depending on the query. So uh, in the old days of SEO, it used to make a lot of sense to rank order um, what people think was the most important ranking factor. But now um, the algorithm has gotten more sophisticated. We've gotten more sophisticated and we, we all kind of almost all of us agree uh, that these things are not set in stone, but in fact, they change. And so that makes algorithms really, really hard to understand. If you're not living and breathing it every day, uh, it's easy to just gloss over and think Google's just really smart. Uh, but there are also differences uh, from device. So you'll get a different um, result. Uh, between mobile tablet and desktop or laptop. And Google reports on these um, through their own reporting platform. So we can know that not only are um, is the same search getting different rankings, but it's also getting different levels of click-through uh, from the search result. And there's also um, something that Google doesn't report on, but it's very clear if you just do test searches on your phone and on your desktop, um, there's a different organization of the page. Uh, and this can be very important because in the mobile phone, we have less space to show information. And so in desktop, we may have two columns of information. We may have the paid stuff and the blue links over here and a knowledge graph or a map pack over here. Uh, but when you do the same search in mobile, all of that is stacked. And the knowledge graph or anything uh, that shows up on the right that's not ads is very likely to show up at the top of the, mo the mobile search result, pushing any of the blue links or organic rankings, even map packs, uh, down. And that makes them less visible in some ways. That's part of the filter. They're less visible to the mobile user. Google potentially believes strongly in the other content, the knowledge graph, the map pack, the stuff they stop, stack at the top. They think users are gonna find what they want there. Uh, and so they push the blue links further down, filtering them potentially out of visibility in some cases. Uh, and so let's look at how this plays out. Uh, this is uh, differences from one location for another. And I do a sample query for the word disease control or the phrase disease control. And I'm doing this from uh, Los Angeles uh, in the zip code 90210 because let's be fun. Uh, and so what you see here is the number one ranking is for the cdc.gov. That makes sense. Uh, the CDC has got a nice result there that has an image and then it has some a sideways scroller uh, for different uh, different pages on the site or potentially different information on that page. Then we've got a people also ask result where Google is trying to ascertain, did, did you need a specific question answered? Um, or are you just kind of browsing, looking for search results? Now, the, the second organic query is the one that's boxed in red. And this is publichealth.lacounty.gov. So this is not the CDC. It is the local public health department, which is associated with the CDC, but it's a different website. It's not the CDC. Now, if we move just 10 miles away from Los Angeles to Burbank, uh, we'll do Burbank uh, 91526. That's about 17 kilometers, 10 miles away. Do the exact same search, just 10 miles away. Um, and what we get is a first result for the CDC and a second result for the CDC, a specific page on the CDC site. You can see it says cdc.gov. That's a different website, a different page, different information, not specific to LA. Now, there are arguments here whether or not this is a good decision by Google, right? Maybe the people in Burbank would be happier to receive something local that's LA oriented, that's from the area, rather than just going to the CDC. Maybe not. We don't know. Uh, but important to know that just moving 10 miles, 17 kilometers, can change uh, the result a a as high as number two. Um, and in some cases, uh, it probably could change number one, uh, but that would be even less likely. So often the results are very similar, uh, but um, not always. 
Now, the next case, we change the language. So we're uh, doing the search this time from the exact same place, uh, but we've changed the phone language to Bulgarian. Uh, and in this case, we're searching for Toyota Bulgaria. What's interesting here, we're in Denver um, and we're searching for Toyota Bulgaria. The result, including the paid result, is still in English um, because um, that's all they have in their inventory. But you can see that the information about the sponsorship of the ad and the call to action at the bottom with the phone icon, those are translated. So Google cares enough about those things to make sure that whoever is searching with their language set to Bulgarian sees them, understands them. Uh, if we go into maps, we get an even richer translated result where we're searching in English, again, searching in English for restaurants near me, but Google is translating a lot of this result. You can see they've left restaurant in English, but the stuff under the word restaurant is in Bulgarian. Uh, the filters under the map that says uh, one mile away, open now, things like that, those are in Bulgarian. Uh, they've left the, the name of the restaurant for both um, the sponsored one and the organic one, Season 52 and Cafe de France. Those aren't translated, uh, but all the information below them is translated except for the street name uh, because they want people to be able to find the street name exactly as it's written. Uh, so Google is trying hard to translate and present results slightly differently. Um, and they're even trying to match what a user's stated languages despite the query language. So they say that they speak Bulgarian, they set it up in the phone that way, but they're searching in English. Google's like, we're gonna try really hard for you, uh, but we're a little bit confused, but this is what we think you want. And so that's different. That changes the scope, that changes the, the reality that people are exposed to. And again, remember, in screen we trust, uh, and also in my screen I trust. So people are more likely to put a lot of weight in what they see and forget that other people might be seeing something differently because of all of the different aspects of the algorithm and, and the settings and the things that weigh in. Now, also remember that the mobile phone is a limited space. If people are searching for videos on their phone, they're getting a different result. But if you're at work looking into what people might be getting and you're doing test searches on your computer, you're going to think very different things. Now, if we just do the simple search for NATO, we have a lot of interesting information that Google's uh, really working hard to highlight. It's not just websites. First, on the left, we have what we call a featured snippet, uh, and this is a lifted bit of information uh, from a highly trusted website. It's often Wikipedia, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, but it gives you just a little bit of information to potentially help you answer a question. The implied question here is, what is NATO? So that's the featured snippet. Those are happening more and more. In fact, in the past couple of years, we've seen a, a 6x increase in the number of featured snippets that show up in results. Um, and then there's the knowledge graph on the right. Now, the knowledge graph um, is more like a real encyclopedia entry. It lifts information, uh, again, from trusted sources from all over the web. Uh, again, often it's Wikipedia, but it doesn't have to be. Um, and this is interesting because it's shareable. You can see the little uh, triangle-shaped uh, triple dot uh, share option at the top. Uh, this is shareable, almost like it was a web page, but it doesn't have its own URL. But it does tend to rank at the top of queries um, that are uh, topical where Google is saying, I know what this is, and this thing that you're searching for, it, it stays the same. It has uh, essential qualities that stay the same uh, in all cases. Uh, and so these things look like this when you're on a desktop computer, but when you're on a mobile phone, they'll be stacked. And usually they'll be stacked knowledge graph first, then featured snippet, then blue links. Uh, and so on mobile, those things would take away from the available traffic on this first nato.int uh, homepage result. Now, Google is trying to do that kind of a thing, answering questions and lifting information directly into a search result more and more. You can see uh, in the example on the left for a query, how to tie a tie, you've got the filter bubbles, how to tie a tie YouTube, how to tie a tie step-by-step, -step, how to tie a tie art of manliness. 
Um, but Google is lifting this video directly into the search result. And not only that, you can see that they have uh, the blue line that says suggested clip 64 seconds. So it's not just that they're showing you the video, they're trying to show you exactly where in the video you're gonna get your answer. So you don't have to play the whole thing. They're trying to lift exactly what the searcher needs. And again, potentially filtering out the beginning of that video um, because Google thinks they know algorithmically uh, what the best part of the video that answers your question is. On the right, podcasting for beginners, you can see similar but different result. Um, they have the video ranking that's playable and instead of having one suggested clip, they have four. Um, and they show you the different parts of where this uh, snippet of the video occurs in the larger video time frame. Again, Google trying really hard to surface exactly the answer to people's questions, even if it's not written in text, even if it's just video. Um, we have similar things happening with uh, podcasts. Google is trying really hard to rank a lot of podcasting information uh, and playable podcasts directly from the search result. I tend to believe that this is because Google is trying to build out their database of potential answers that are voice only, that don't have to have a screen. Uh, they like video a lot, but video is best consumed with a screen. You can sometimes listen to audio only uh, and potentially you could cast it. Uh, but with an audio result and especially a podcast, they just have to have a connected speaker of some sort. So it's kind of the minimum viable uh, answer that's interactive uh, even without a screen. And this is important because right now Google is just surfacing uh, entire podcast episodes, but we believe uh, similarly to the clips of videos, they're gonna start surfacing clips of podcasts. And this is also relevant because podcasts are often informative. Uh, they're often news oriented or information oriented, and they're very often Q&A with a lot of interviews. Um, and Q&A fits what Google's trying to do with surfacing and answering more uh, questions. Uh, and in fact, in the digital community, we've started talking about Google less as a search engine and more as an answer engine. And in this phone image on the left, you can see uh, how much Google likes podcasts. It's rare to see anything rank above a knowledge graph result, but in this case, the query had the podcast carousel first of playable podcasts and the knowledge graph second. Uh, so they must really think that this is a good result that people care about podcasts a lot. Uh, and interesting is, Below the knowledge graph, we have uh, a Twitter feed from that podcast that also has a playable video. Um, so we have a YouTube clip uh, from something that was originally submitted in YouTube, shared on Twitter, and now that's showing up in both YouTube and Twitter uh, and uh, Google Podcasts uh, and Knowledge Graph. So building something out, a podcasting brand like this, it has the potential to rank lots of different places, not just where it starts. Uh, since the videos are shareable, it can be uh, surfaced directly in Google from Twitter with an origin in YouTube. Uh, and so that's where things can get really complicated, but that's also where strategy can come in. Uh, and that's also where having someone who understands uh, what the ranking potential of something is uh, can be important. Because remember, again, this is a podcast. It didn't even have to have a video at all, uh, but doing the video gives them so much more exposure and potential rankings. Now, the next concept uh, to understand about kind of answering the question, why are algorithms so difficult? is that more and more the algorithms are being driven by machine learning. Uh, and so the algorithm is learning based on users' feedback. And it's not direct feedback in that users are saying, I don't like this. It's feedback based on how users are clicking and interacting with the result. So if a user does a search and then scrolls and constantly clicks on the last result, that last result is most likely gonna start to start to rank higher because Google sees it as people voting for that result to rank better and that people aren't finding what they want in the results above it. And that's a very simplified understanding of how Google uses user feedback, but they've built out such an amazing understanding of the users um, and feedback and the algorithms. And the algorithm is now so complex 
Um, and a lot of it is driven by machine learning to the point where when Google launches an update now, they're not exactly sure what's going to happen because so much of the, the rankings and the algorithm are driven by machine learning. And so they're kind of driving blind for a while and they have to launch it, see what happens and potentially roll it back. Um, and so we see that happening more and more where Google used to be kind of callous and just launch an update and say, you know, that's what it is and good luck to you. Um, now they launch, they see what happens and if it went well, they keep it. If users seem to be happy or happier, especially, they keep it. If users seem to be less satisfied, do, seem to be looking harder uh, for the right result, then they might roll it back. But, but just knowing that Google doesn't even know exactly what's gonna happen when they make a change. Uh, now, the most recent change that Google made um, that got a lot of attention was called, well, they've made uh, algorithm updates, but they made a major overhaul in how they crawl and index the web uh, in the past two years, and it's called mobile-first indexing. Um, and the idea was that Google would now crawl and index the web as if it was being shown on a mobile phone, but I saw, I noticed that that was the time when really Google started showing more and more answers as well. And I tend to believe that mobile first indexing is more about surfacing answers. And when Google says mobile, they're thinking not just of mobile phones, but also digital assistance and the portability of information and answers. Um, and so that fits well with surfacing more answers uh, that could potentially be read out over a digital assistant kind of speaker. The problem is that Google was trying to answer so many questions so quickly um, that they often got it wrong. Um, and there was a lot of humor had um, by SEOs when they saw that Google, how wrong Google was getting it. Uh, so in this query, how many legs does the answer is uh, six. How many legs does a snake have? Four. Now those are, you know, funny um, and potentially harmless and, and clearly show that Google's made some mistakes, right? Uh, but it, it gets more questionable when you ask Google uh, more weighty questions. Um, who's the king of the United States? Barack Obama. That's potentially a controversial question and answer pairing. Um, a little bit worse, is Obama planning a coup? Uh, and the answer in this featured snippet is essentially yes. So that's where we get into really uh, potentially problematic things that are caused by algorithms that could be uh, in an unfortunate way echoed, repeated, uh, because uh, things that are proven and safe are filtered out or are beat by people who are in this case, the only one writing about a topic. Um, so people weren't writing a lot of articles about Obama not planning a coup. And so the only article that Google could find any kind of answer here said that he was, right? And so they're amplifying things just for lack of, of alternate facts or at lack, lack of contradictory facts, I should say. Um, but we, as journalists shouldn't be expected to write about everything that's not happening uh, just so that Google can surface a good answer. So this is an interesting conundrum. Uh, other things that have happened more recently um, to help Google stop showing bad answers are an update to the algorithm that we call EAT, which stands for Expertise, Authority, and Trust, and then another one called YMYL, or Your Money or Your Life. And in both of these, Google tried harder to only surface answers from sites that had expertise, authority, and trust. And in cases where um, your money or your life was at stake, for instance, a, a coup in the United States, your life would be at stake, uh, Google would try even harder to either not show an answer or uh, to show an answer that they were definitely sure was from a very authoritative source um, and was very clear and well vetted. Uh, and then the most recent algorithm update is one called BERT. BERT um, has very large, uh, long name. It stands for bidirectional encoder representation representations from transformers. Now in this, what it essentially means uh, transformers is um, 
words before and after another word, and long uh, sentences in context. And the idea behind BERT is basically just that Google is trying harder to take uh, words, phrases, and sentences in a larger context. So they don't just look at, at one word at a time, and they don't just look at one phrase at a time. They look at the modifiers before and after within the sentence and potentially within the paragraph or the page. Now, with that in mind, we can take it to the next step and show you what I believe is one of the best ways of really getting into Google's brain. And that is uh, Google's uh, machine learning language, uh, which they used to call it the Cloud Natural Language API. Now it's just called the Natural Language API. But what this does is you can take text from the web, from your website potentially, um, and put it in to this API uh, from the main site uh, and see exactly how Google processes it. And anything that they've color coded on the right, they have recognized as an entity. And you can see that they have information about entities, sentiment, syntax, and categories, categories of information. So I took the homepage copy from the Census 2020 uh, website, so US Census 2020, uh, and put it in here to break it down. And you can see in this that Google has identified the census as an organization, a family as a person. The US Census Bureau is an organization that has a Wikipedia article. Uh, a partner is a person, US code. They say it's an organization, that's maybe interesting. Um, and we have country, they call it, they say this is a location. So they're doing kind of an okay job of breaking this down. It's not brilliant, but it is pretty good. Um, but what's more interesting is when you drill into um, the tabs that Google gives you, you can see that they have broken down every sentence in the page that I put the text in for um, and, and diagrammed the sentences. So you can see what is the noun, what is the verb, what's an adverb, uh, and how are these things related? Is this uh, verb describing this noun? Um, and so that's where they're getting things like sentiment uh, and stuff like that. This is pretty sophisticated uh, in terms of understanding. And this is, I think, uh, potentially the crux of BERT and the ideas uh, around BERT. How do these words, how does one word relate to another in a sentence and in a paragraph? Now, you might think that's the end of it, but it's not. They're doing something very similar with images. So I took uh, an image just straight from Google Images about the 2020 census. I'm not even sure um, who, who made this and who that logo is in the upper left, uh, but I wanted to see what Google thought of it. So you can upload the image and what Google says is, okay, it's 85% text. It does appear you know, to be advertising. We believe that 73%. And we, we also think it's probably some kind of a flyer. So that seems pretty accurate. That, that sounds good. If we look at it on the web, what it's trying to do is surface specific entities or ideas. So the web entities that it's picking up from from this are the concept of every 10 years, which is how often we do the sentence, the 2020 United States Senate uh, Census, United States Census Bureau, Constitution of the United States, United States, the concept of a sentence, and then Delta Sigma Theta. When we get here, we understand, oh my gosh, Google knows who that logo is for on the left. It's, it's uh, a sorority or a fraternity, uh, Delta Sigma Theta. So they are helping the U.S. Census Bureau by creating this flyer, by getting people to participate in the U.S. Census. Um, so that's pretty interesting. And the, they score their confidence with these entities uh, numerically on the right. So that's pretty sophisticated stuff. If you think about it, when Google's crawling and indexing the web, they're working really hard to break down all the sentences in, in super sophisticated fashion, but also do something very similar uh, with the images on the page. Um, and the last part is safe search. They're trying to decide, is this an adult search? Is this a spoof? Um, if it were video, potentially they'd be looking for a deep fake in the spoof category. Um, is this medical? Is there violence in this video? Is it somehow racy? Uh, so that's pretty cool. 
And, and what that kind of sophistication is getting us is more detailed answers in the search results to questions. Uh, but because they can process the images and the text more clearly, uh, they have less need to send you the traffic because they can lift the best of it directly into a search query. So in this example, we see how to clean suede now, it assumes that we want to clean suede boots, probably a good assumption. Um, and on the left, we see that the featured snippet gives us a little bit of information about how it thinks we should clean the suede. But then it gives us buttons where we can drill down uh, to ask a more specific question or ask for more specific instructions. So how to que clean suede, suede with vinegar, how to clean suede on shoes, how to clean white suede, how to clean suede with water. Um, and on the right, you can see there also, if you scroll, um, there are expanders. Now we have a slightly different result uh, between the right and the left, uh, but similar kinds of experiences where Google is saying, okay, maybe you need a paragraph or maybe you need step-by-step -step instructions. Uh, and here's some basic step-by-step -step instructions. But if you have more detailed needs, AKA you want to clean your shoes with vinegar or you need to clean mud off your shoes. Here are some expansion buttons. And those change a little bit uh, from, from result to result, but you can see the level of sophistication that Google is giving us in the result. And also notice that the images between the left and the right are slightly different, um, potentially because Google thinks they're more aligned with the step-by-step -step instructions or the paragraph. So Google's trying much harder. And I think that in many cases, even SEOs in my industry don't give Google enough credit for how much work goes into surfacing, uh, knowing when to surface a paragraph versus step-by-step -step instructions, knowing whether to show filters versus uh, text expanders and, and surfacing the right images with the right text. It's pretty cool. But it's hard to measure. And that's the problem that, that people in my industry are, are facing, are upset with, are struggling with, is that all of this is hard to measure because so many things can change the search result. Um, and if you have a very specific um, marketing scenario that you're going after, uh, then you want to know very specific details and measure them. So for instance, if you are just a nail salon in Denver, you don't care what rankings look like anywhere else in the world. You just care about Denver and likely you just care about the neighborhood that you're in uh, or maybe the zip code that you're in, but maybe not the whole city. Um, and so getting an aggregated result for just the city or even just the zip code might not be enough for you. Um, so we developed a tool to help companies with this, and it can be useful um, for all kinds of, of companies, uh, agencies, uh, governments, groups, NGOs. Um, and I have an example here that shows you why. In this case, um, we know that in the United States, uh, with uh, the census happening, uh, the census was a big way that some groups were trying to suppress certain voters and voter suppression with the next 2020 election has been a big topic of information. Now, there could be videos uh, or websites or images that are misleading uh, to help with a voter suppression effort. If we got a video to go viral that said the wrong dates uh, for 2020 voting or gave wrong information about who could and couldn't vote or gave wrong information about where and when to vote, when votes were due, that could be potentially problematic, but it could also be very localized. So just doing a test in your particular location, if you care about stopping voter suppression, isn't going to be enough. You might need to use a tool like this and upload a bunch of addresses uh, in a CSV to test uh, queries like how to vote, when to vote, where to vote, to see if there's any kind of suppressive um, content that might be ranking. And beyond just organic rankings, there could be uh, political groups that are paying for misleading ads because you see in this query, there are a lot of ads. Uh, so, so that could be a problem. Uh, the other thing that we've done, so that tool is called the Serperator. It's the one on the left. You can pull in um, your analytics from Google Search Console and Google Analytics uh, into it to see what are they telling you versus what are people actually seeing. And then on, on the right, we have a tool called the Pagescope, which also lets you 
investigate pages uh, to from specific locations because in some cases websites will redirect uh, people who are from a specific country to show them a different page uh, and this also could be uh, some some type of subversion uh, sometimes it's to adhere to the law uh, but it has potential uses where it's trying to subvert um, any kind of um, investigation or oversight. Uh, so we have the PagerScope too. Uh, and so I hope you've learned a little bit about how algorithms work uh, and how they can be important for uh, surfacing or suppressing information. Uh, if you want to try any of the tools that I showed you, uh, we have a promo code for 30 days free, all access to the tools that includes the location testing, uploading, uh, so you can test one keyword in a bunch of locations uh, and then test another keyword in a bunch of locations. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed this talk. Uh, please reach out to me uh, on Twitter if you have questions or comment below. Uh, and the tools are available right at mobilemoxie.com with that promo code webinar uh, 006. Thanks for your attention.